start recording. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salam alaykum everyone. Uh, welcome to welcome to the introduction to Shia Hadith for English speakers. Okay, so a little bit of a background uh, introduction why I made this. So the reason why I made this, one of the things that I noticed in the Shia community is that we have a very, very big inferiority complex. We have this belief that we need to prove everything that we believe from Sunni books in order to prove Shia beliefs. And what you'll often find is that you'll have a lot of polemicists, you'll have a lot of people on Discord, a lot of people on Twitter, YouTube comment sections, Reddit. What they're doing is they're going and spending all of their energy reading Sunni books, Bukhari, Muslim, this and this and this and that. And they're, they're, they're focusing all their energy and time on, on all these books. They can quote Bukhari hadiths from memory. They can quote Muslim hadiths from memory. But they can't even know even one or two chapters from Al-Kafi. They don't even know the names of the four books. Um, and this is a problem. This is a problem. You know, how is it possible that someone... <laughs> it's, it's amusing the, to, that, that someone who has no idea about Shia beliefs is trying to prove Shia beliefs from Sunni books when they have no idea what Shia beliefs are in the first place. So this is why I'm making this presentation. I'm making this presentation so that the average person, a layman, can go on and say, okay, here's where I can find out about my beliefs. Here's where I can learn about the words of the Imams. Here's where I can learn about, you know, what's important and what's not important in our religion. So as I was mentioning, <clears throat> one of the problems that we're facing in our community is polemics, right? Uh, and and, our, and our, we have many narrations that are very harsh against polemics. So, for example, we have this narration here in Amari al-Saduq, which says, Beware of argumentation because it creates doubts, nullifies deeds, degrades its initiator. And it may also happen to be that someone speaks about something for which he is never forgiven. What does this mean? Because people who are in polemics, people who don't know Shia beliefs, but they're trying to prove Shia beliefs, they're speaking about things that they have no idea about. They come to conclusions that they, that they, that they shouldn't come to because they have this inferiority complex of trying to prove everything from Sunni hadith, from trying to prove everything from Sunni books. You know, we should leave these Sunni books aside for a second. We should learn our beliefs. And only until we learn our beliefs are we able to start debating again. Because there's the second hadith that I have linked here. It says, I said to Abi Abdullah, so if this is in response to Jafar al-Tayyar, <clears throat> uh, it has been conveyed to me that you dislike us debating the people. So the Imam says, he responds, it's a, a paraphrase, he responds, if you can debate well, then you can debate. If you know your beliefs, if you know your religion, if you know what's what, then you're allowed to debate. You cannot debate until you know your beliefs, until you know Shia books, until you know Shia beliefs, you cannot debate. This is the, this is the bottom line. And this is why I want to make this presentation for everyone. <clears throat> so one of, the, one of the big problems that people one of the big fears that people might face when, when going into Shia Hadith is that they might feel as though they'll become misguided. They might feel as though they, they don't have the privilege to, to read the Shia Hadith. Uh, or they might get this idea in their head that, like, um, uh, that oh, only the scholars are allowed to touch Hadith. Only the scholars are allowed to read Hadith. Uh, and, that, and that this is some arcane, esoteric knowledge that we can never, we can never touch. Right? But this is completely incorrect. Right? The Prophet said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam said, I leave behind with you two weighty things, the Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. How is it that we can learn this religion? How is it that we can call ourselves Shia and not have any idea of what the Imams speak, not have any idea of what the Imams' words are? This is why it's absolutely necessary for us to learn, learn to read hadith. And so with that, I'd like to, I'd like to play a clip from Sayyid Ali Abul Hassan, uh, who is a, who's a prominent student of Sayyid Sistani, um, and he's one of the best. He's one of the best scholars out there in Hausa right now, in, in the Najaf of Hausa. In fact, he even teaches people who want to become mujtahids. Uh, he's that. He's at that high of a level. So I'd like to play his, his words for you. في شغلة ينبغي الانتباه إليها وهي إن البعض يتصور إن إن لم أكن متخصصا في العلوم الدينية فأنا خارج عن دائرة الاهتمام بالعلم. وهذا من أكبر اشتباه. كل إنسان مؤمن كل إنسان مؤمن ينبغي أن يكون له اهتمام علمي لا يستطيع الإنسان أن يعلو في قربه إلى الله عز وجل من دون علم 
وورد في الروايات أن عالم ينتفع بعلمه رواية صحيحة أن عالم ينتفع بعلمه خير من عبادة سبعين ألف عابد سبعين ألف عابد جيد؟ فطلب العلم ليس مقصورا على طلبة الحوزة نعم كل يعرف قدره كل واحد يعرف قدره لابد من هذا الشيء زين So the takeaway from this clip is that this You do not have to be a scholar You do not have to be a specialist You do not have to be someone who is studied for 8 to 10 years at Hawza in order to read hadith. Anyone can read hadith. Anyone can learn about this religion. Anyone can do it. And you can too. But you have to stay within the guidelines. You have to stay and know your capabilities, your limitations as an English speaker, your limitations as someone who's a layman, who doesn't know the big picture. So as long as you stay within the guidelines, you are more than welcome. And you should read hadith. You should read and learn about this religion. <coughs> So, with that in mind, I'd like to move on to tell everyone some principles to keep in mind as you go into starting to read hadith. Okay? So, I'll start with four principles. Number one is the most powerful three words you'll ever hear in your life. And those words are, I don't know. <clears throat> the second test is, the, is called the idiot test, which I'll explain it a little bit. The third principle is to stay away from DIY fiqh. What I mean by this is, don't go around in al Kafi Volume 4 and then start trying to, you know, figure out what the, the invalidators of fasting are and try to figure out, you know, like, uh, I don't know, the grain tax for zakat or whatever it might be. Leave that to the ulama. Leave that to the marjas. Leave that to Sayyid Sistani. Leave that to, you know, Wahid Khurasani, Rahimullah. You know, leave that, to, leave that to these people, right? This is their specialty. Don't, don't delve into DIY fiqh. And then the fourth principle to keep in mind is to prioritize authenticity. So... <clears throat> The most powerful three words in the world, I don't know. We have a hadith which says, what you may know, speak up to it. But what you don't know, say Allah knows best. So this is me to say that you should only speak what you know. You should only understand. You should only delve into what you're able to understand, what you're able to know. Don't delve into matters that, that, uh, that you, you don't have the paycheck for, that you don't have the pay grade for. Stay within your pay grade. Stay within your understanding, within your level of knowledge. Be humble. Uh, and if you find something that's confusing, if you find something that's, that's difficult or that you don't know, you, don't, you can't understand right away, it's simple. Just be restrained. Like, just, just have restraint. And we have a hadith about Gafi which says, restraint in confusing cases is better than indulging in destruction. So instead of coming up with radical theories, instead of coming up with uh, weird beliefs, just simply hold back and say, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have the big picture. I am just a layman. I don't know enough to, to address this. Right? So again, the most powerful three words, the most powerful three words in the world, I don't know. Number two is the idiot test. So from the same hadith, uh, Kulaini relates, follow what is unanimously agreed upon because there is no harm in what is unanimously agreed upon. Now, I'd like to say something, right? We as Shia, we don't have this same Reservate. We don't have this same uh, reverence for for uh, ijma as the Sunnis do. It's very true that our scholars have no no qualms about questioning the consensus of our sect. However, there's a difference. There's a difference between what I'm saying and what this is. What I'm saying is, we as laymen, we as people who don't have the knowledge of the scholars, we as laymen who don't understand the same things as the scholars, we should stay away from things. We should stay away from beliefs that end up making a majority of the sect look stupid. So let me give you an example. There's this interesting user on Discord. Um, I won't mention any names, but he, he goes around and he starts saying, Ilm al-Rajal is ghiba, it's bid'a, it's, uh, it's kufr, uh, it's shirk, you know, it's so on and so on and so forth. And he says, everyone who uses Ilm al-Rajal is a kafir. Everyone who uses Ilm al-Rajal is, is a, is a mubtadir, right? So now, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, that guy. Um, let's, so let's, let's unpack that statement for a second, right? If his reading of the hadith, if his reading and understanding of the hadith made him come to this conclusion, okay, what does this conclusion entail? This conclusion entails, Sheikh Al-Kulaini is a kafir, Sheikh Saduq is a kafir, Sheikh Tusi is a kafir, Allama Al-Hilli is a kafir, Shahid Al-Thani is a kafir, Allama Al-Majlis is a kafir, uh, uh, Sayyid Al-Khui is a kafir, Sayyid Sistani is a kafir, so on and so on and so forth. So if you agree with him, 
you have made takfir on a majority of the of a majority of our scholars. So if your beliefs end up doing things like this, then then they're they're simply incorrect, right? <laughs> if you if your views end up doing this, they're incorrect. So when you're reading hadith, when you're reading hadith in al-Kafi, when you're reading hadith in, in any of these books, do not come to opinions or conclusions that end up doing this sort of thing that ends up takfiring a majority of the ummah or, or, or calling them stupid or calling them uh, muqtadir. Uh, this is why it's called the idiot test. If your beliefs make everyone look like an idiot, you're the idiot. So with that, we'll move on to the next, uh, uh, the next case. So the next principle to keep in mind is to stay away from DIY fiqh. So as everyone on Discord probably knows, and everyone on the internet probably knows this phrase by now, ask your marja. If you don't know about something about fiqh, don't go into Al Kafi and trying to prove your own like your your own ideas about fiqh. Don't do that. Just go ask your marja. Your your marja's risala is publicly available on the internet. They have researched far more than you could ever do in your entire lifetime. Uh, they know far more than you ever know. They have studied far more subjects than you will ever study in your lifetime. Uh, so it's just better to simply go to your marja and find out your fiqh from there. However, um, there is a very good thing about reading fiqhi hadith. Uh, one of the benefits of fiqhi hadith is, is this. So sometimes we feel as though the time period of the imams, the time period of the Prophet wasallam is very like far away from us. We feel like, oh look, these are just like, these are kind of like fantasy miracle stories, you know, like this was a time back when people had miracles, back when jinns existed, back when, you know, like fairies existed. And now we live in like the post-industrial modern world where all of these things are just like everything's scientific now and everything's, you know, so cold and, 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 and hardened and we have nothing to, we have nothing to, to base our beliefs on anymore, right? <clears throat> One of the things that can connect you to that time period one of the things that can connect you to the imams and can connect you to the Prophet ﷺ is to go through your marja's risala and to find out the hadiths that correspond to them. Why is this important? Because one of the things that you can do is that when you're doing wudu, you realize the wudu that I am doing is the wudu of the imams, is the wudu of the Prophet ﷺ. When I'm doing my, when I'm doing my five daily prayers, this is the prayer of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam, right? There's no difference to it. And when you realize this, when you find these hadith, when you find these uh, these little these special nooks and crannies in in the hadith corpus, uh, you will come to have a special connection to the to the to the infallibles sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi, right? So if you're really curious about if you're really curious about fiqh, one of the most uh, helpful resources that you can find is actually Ayatollah Taqi Mudarrisi's Rasala, uh, which is on my website by the way. Um, I'll link it at the end. <clears throat> and throughout his risala, what he does is he'll post the rulings, and then he'll post the hadith that linked that ruling. So, for example, if he says you must wipe your hands in a certain way, he'll find the hadith that says exactly that. So, if you want to do fiqh, if you want to, if you want to, if you're curious about it, this is the way to go about it. Do not do your own fiqh. Stay within the guidelines. Stay within your 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 majah. And finally, the fourth. Uh, the fourth principle to keep in mind is to prioritize authenticity, okay? So this goes without saying, okay? This, this goes without saying, right? Uh, one of the most fatal sins, the most grave possible sins that a, a Muslim can commit is to lie purposefully on, the, on, on an infallible, right? One of the most mutawatir narrations, in fact, this is so mutawatir that it's probably one of the most mutawatir narrations out there. Um, and it says, oh, oh people, Many lies has spread about me and they could, what they consider to be my hadith. Whoever forges a lie and calls them my hadith, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, has filled up his seat with fire. So, in other words, if you purposely lie on the Prophet, you, you're going to go to hell, guaranteed. Um, now, of course, if you're, if, you're, if you're being honest, if you're being humble, if you're being you know, uh, sane, not insane, um, you will, and, you, and you make a mistake, there's no problem with that, right? But the point is, is you have to be honest. You have to be good. You have to have good intentions. You cannot just simply say, like, you cannot be reckless about, about, uh, about being inauthentic with, with narrations. Um, so, and, and this is, and prioritizing authenticity doesn't necessarily also have to mean that you, you worship ulama rajal either. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit here and go, well, this hadith is da'if, therefore I'm not even going to use it, therefore I'm never going to read it, therefore I'm not going to touch it, whatever, whatever, whatever. But I'll address this later. But... It doesn't necessarily have to mean that. 
by what I mean by prioritizing authenticity is to prioritize trying to understand and trying to sift out what is weak material and from what is strong material. However you do that. I don't care how you do that. I don't care you know, what the method you use, but the point is you have to prioritize authenticity. If you don't prioritize authenticity, then your study of hadith is incorrect. <clears throat> now I have a, a clip here from uh, 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 Sheikh Ahmed, Ahmed al-Hassan, uh, and so hopefully it will play here. <laughs> oh, sorry, let me introduce this clip. This clip is basically um, the, the fatwas of Sayyid Sistani on narrating weak and strong hadith. So uh, he's basically explaining the guidelines of how, of how you should understand and, or, and categorize uh, different hadith. <laughs> هذه لا شك في جواز نقلها عندنا روايات مكذوبة موضوعة معلومة الكذب والوضع هذه يحكم نقلها عندنا منطقة في النصف هي روايات ضعيفة أو غير ثابتة ولكنها محتملة الصدور هذه الرواية يجوز أن تنقل لا بعنوان الإثبات والإخبار عن واقع خارجية وإنما بعنوان الحكاية عن أصل الكتاب مثل ما يذكر في رمضان في نهار رمضان في الكذب على الله ورسول المعصومين إذا قلت قال الإمام تفطر نفطر وإذا قلت غوى فلان عن الإمام وأسندت الرواية إلى الكتاب لا لا تفطر لا يكون هذا كذبا على الله ورسول الآن أنت إذا على المنبر رواية من هذا القسم الثالث ونقلتها بعنوان الحكاية على الكتاب لا بعنوان قال الصادق قال الباقي أو بعنوان حصل كذا يجوز ولكن ولكن هذا الحين توضيح So um, what's the what's the main takeaway from this the main takeaway from this is look know know what's weak know what's strong what if you know what's strong then then please go ahead and use it if you know what's weak, don't use it. Stay away from it. Uh, it just, you know, it's as simple as that. It's common sense. I don't even have to say this. So, anyways, um, now that we've learned the principles of how to read a hadith, now let's go into where we can find these hadith. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's, let's pay attention to some important websites that you need to know about first. So, some of these important websites, the reason why they're important is because they'll give you context to hadith. They'll, they'll let you learn about, you know, the various parts of our sect, history of our sect, different debates that have happened throughout our, throughout Shiism, uh, different beliefs that have occurred, so on and so on and so forth. So there's a list of these here. Uh, Iqra Online is one very good one. One of the best websites you can go to is ShiitikStudies.com uh, because this is a very academic website. Uh, they have a lot of good they have a lot of good art articles and content that explain a lot of the important parts of our corpus. Uh, ShiaChat.com is also helpful. Uh, there's a lot of garbage there, of course, but if you go on my website, which I've mentioned here, it's zorala.com, if you go on my website into the recommended reading section, I have picked out and found a lot of the good threads that are on there from a lot of the good authors from Shia Chat, uh, and you can go through these, you can go through these threads, and they're very educational, they're very helpful. Of course, there's also alislam.org. Uh, again, like with all of these websites, there is some good articles and there's some bad articles. The only article, the only website that I'll say that doesn't have anything bad on it is shiaticstudies.com uh, that, and even that's just like you know uh, like there's nothing bad on that website I, I don't think um, now as for as, and as for the other two these are these are two telegram channels or YouTube channels that you can use purified truth and, and brillebooks.com so those two videos that I just showed you they're from purified truth they, they translate a lot of videos they translate a lot of Arabic articles uh, and they're very helpful now oh website, wait uh, oh yeah never mind yeah go on I was just going to say about Hubei Ali, but you got that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so look, so now, websites for primary sources. So if you're trying to find hadith, where do you have to look? You have to look on these three websites. Thaqalain.net, HubbeAli.com, and Alislam.org. Now, I have a list of these books here, which you might be able to find, and I'll, be able, I'll go into a little bit more detail about them in a bit. So now, the most important books to know about are these. Now, I'm going to go through each of one of them in lightning speed as, as fast as I can because uh, there's a lot to cover uh, but you know we'll, we'll go through we'll go through each of them 
So first and foremost, the most important book ever in Shiism. Uh, there is no book in Shiism aside from the Quran that is more important than this book. Uh, it is it is a book that has everything in it. The, re, the it's titled Al Kafi, meaning sufficient. Literally, it is Kafi for people. Uh, it, it is it is so comprehensive. It covers everything. It covers from your basics of knowledge, from Tawheed to prophethood to imama, from belief and disbelief, from good deeds and sins, from du'a to the Quran, your fiqh in all of its detail, various sunnahs of the imams, ser sermons of the imams, uh, uh, and, and so on and so on and so forth. This is the most important book you'll ever read. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this book specifically at, at, towards the end of this presentation. We're almost done. The next book is Al-Tawheed. Al-Tawheed covers all of the aqidah that you need to know about with Allah. So it has all the hadith from the imams about various aspects. So it'll cover, you know, divine simplicity. You know, the attributes are the same as the essence. Uh, all the names of Allah are not, you know, are not indicative of anything about the essence. They're just, you know, whatever. Uh, the attributes of action, attributes of essence, Allah's justice, da'wil of verses of the Quran, which talk about, quote-unquote, anthropomorphism, uh, free will, predestination, so on and so forth. So this, this book will cover it. And they have hadith of, about all those subjects in this book. Next, you have Basair al-Darajat. Now, Basair al-Darajat uh, is a book by Sheikh Safar al-Qummi, and it covers about the fada'il of the imams and the prophets, uh, their miracles, their merits, uh, the, and things about salvation of Shi'as and non-Shi'a. So what you'll find in this hadith, if you want to know about like miracles of the imams, you can go to Basair al-Darajat. If you want to know about like the knowledge of the imams, you can go to Basair al-Darajat. So this is a very helpful book in this regard, and it's a good book. Um, uh, the next book we have on this list is Kamil al-Ziyarat. So Kamil al-Ziyarat has a lot of narrations about uh, Muharram, uh, Ziyarat of Imam Hussein, mourning, uh, and in fact I'm sure everyone's heard this famous hadith which says, one who sheds a tear the size of uh, a fly's wing, uh, then, then it, paradise will be obligatory on him uh, if he cries for Imam Hussein. And so this, this hadith, among many others, is in Kamil al-Ziyarat, and you'll find things like it in Kamil al-Ziyarat, like how to do ziyarat, What's the, what's the intention that you need to have, and so on and so forth. The next book is Uyun Akhbar al-Rida. It's also by Sheikh al-Saduq. Uh, and it goes through the life of Imam Rida, and it mentions his debates with al -Ma'mun, uh, the, the Caliph Ma'mun, uh, and it mentions a lot of other things in very scattered beliefs. It's not as organized as the other books that I've mentioned, but it's a very good and helpful book, and you'll find a lot of good in it. <clears throat> the, next book, the next two sets of books that we have are the two Ghaibas. So one, one Kitab al-Ghaibah is written by Shaykh al-Tusi and the other one is written by Shaykh al-Nu'mani. So in these books are you know, things like the proofs of the existence of Imam Mahdi uh, and, and arguments and rhetoric against the, the dead Shia splinter sects that have existed in the past, like for example, Waqafism and, and, and like the Kaysaniya, for example. All of these are covered in this, on these two books and they're refuted in these books and, the proofs, and the, the proofs for the existence of Imam Mahdi are also covered in this book. In these books. The next book we have is Ilal al Sharia. So this book is literally called Reasons for the, the Sharia, right? Uh, al Ilal. So what you'll find in this book is you'll find reasons for why things are halal, why things are haram, uh, and you'll also find things like uh, like history. So like you know why didn't Imam Ali give back uh, Fadak? Why didn't Imam Ali take back Fadak when he was a caliph? Uh, why did uh, you know when was when was Fadak given to Fatima Salam Allahi alayha? Uh, and so on and so forth, you'll find it in this book. The next book you'll have is Al Khisal. So, I, to be honest, I think Sheikh Saduq probably wrote this when he was bored uh, because, you know, the way it's organized is completely random. Uh, the only organization that it has is that it organizes hadith based off of numbers. So, for example, the Imam will mention, like, oh, here's four characteristics of like a mu'min, for example. And you'll find that in chapter number four, hadith about four numbered things. So, it's literally a book about numbers. Uh, it's a pretty random book. I, I don't know why Sheikh Saduq wrote it in this way or why he wrote it the way it is, but whatever. It, it's a good book. It's, it's, it's helpful. There's some interesting narrations in there. Now, on to secondary sources. So I mentioned the, the, all the hadith I mentioned, all the books I mentioned before were primary sources. So what does that mean? It means that those are the books that were directly compiling uh, straight from the words of the imams. Uh, there was no, there's no like, there's very little intermediary between them. Now, these are secondary sources, which are compilations of the compilations. So, what is Bihar al-Anwar? So, one of the things to keep in mind is that Bihar al-Anwar uh, is a very late source. It's written in the 1600s. So, 
literally when America was getting colonized, this book was being written. So what does that tell you? Number one, it tells you that if you find a hadith in this book, that is only in this book, the chances of it being authentic, the chances of it being reliable, are slim to none. Very slim to none. So when you find these um, when you find these, excuse my language, these idiotic Sunnis who will come and bring you a, a narration that, and the reference is Bihar al Anwar, volume 69, uh, page number 420, uh, what you'll find is that if, this, if that's the only reference for that hadith, you can probably put it one in one ear and out the other. Uh, so, so this book, in, in this sense, it's not meant to be a book of reliable narrations. It's not meant to be a book of, um, you know, like here's, here's, good, here's good solid hadith that you can all rely on. No, this book is really meant for people who are specialists. They're people who want to research all of the hadith on a topic, who want to know all the different beliefs of, okay, look, I want to understand what the Nusayris believed about Imam Ali. So therefore, I'm going to go to this chapter and I'm going to go through Hidayat al-Kubra and I'm going to find out what these Nusayris believed, whatever, right? There's literally random, there's random hadith from all sorts of places in this book. There's even hadith that yeah, Alam al-Majasi literally found on the street in this book. So, for all intents and purposes, when you find a narration from this book, and it's only in this book, then you have to, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, and of course, as usual, uh, this book is also quoting previous books. So it's quoting Al-Kafi, it's quoting Ilal al-Sharia, it's quoting Man al al-Faqi, it's quoting Tahdib al-Ahkam or whatever. Right? So it's quoting all of these previous books. And finally, the last book that we have on our list is Mu'jam al-Hadith al-Mu'tadara. So this is also available on thaqalain.net. Uh, unlike Bihar, unlike Bihar, uh, this is actually a book that you can accept all of the narrations in without batting an eyelid. The way that this book was compiled is by Ayatul Asif al muhsini who passed away uh, very recently, rahimullah. Um, the way this book is compiled is that it, it is meant to take all of the hadith and pass them through the most strict possible standards of ilm al-raja. So, the most strict possible standards of authenticity uh, had to pass in order to in order to get into this book. So it's not yet fully translated, but whatever is in there, you can accept without even batting an eyelid. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to question it. You can accept it for the most part. Pretty much 99.99% of it is acceptable. Uh, and of course, it's going to be translated over time. Uh, the, the translator is a very busy person, but inshallah, it'll be translated soon. So now... Let's talk about Al-Kafi, shall we? <clears throat> so, the, the Al-Kafi is the most important of the four books. There is no book in Shi'ism that is more important than Al-Kafi. Uh, of these four books, there's, uh, this is the only one that's also translated. But, now, this is the most important book, without a question, without a doubt. You cannot, be, you cannot learn Shi'ism. You cannot learn Tashayu in any respect whatsoever, unless you go through this book. You must go through this book and you must learn it. You must have a working familiarity with this book. How is this book organized? This book is organized in eight volumes. The first two volumes are called the Usul. Volumes three through seven are called the Furu, and the eighth volume is called the Rauda. So the Usul consists of the following, the, following, uh, the following topics. It consists of volume one, where it talks about the intellect, the Aql. It talks about knowledge. It talks about... Uh, Tawheed, Nabuwa, and Imama. These are the topics that it covers. Volume 2 covers a little bit more broad categories. So this is a very a very helpful uh, volume for, for people who want to learn more about the religion, especially for people who are kind of afraid of approaching hadith. Volume 2 is the most friendly, friendly volume for anyone. Uh, belief and disbelief are covered in this volume. Good deeds, sins, repentance, social manners, like how to greet people, you know, how to whether to visit people often and so on and so forth. There's du'as in this volume. There's Quran in this. Vo there's like there's narrations about the Quran in this volume. So this is a very helpful volume. It's a very good volume. I think it's probably one of the best pieces of of you know religious. Uh, this is one of the best pieces of religious literature on the planet aside from the Quran. Is volume two of Al Kafi. If you read this, you will you will feel completely renewed about your faith. Uh, you will. This is probably one of the best things you could ever read, and I recommend everyone read Volume Two of Al Kafi if you haven't already. <clears throat> now, the next vol the next set is the Furu, which is all the Fiqh, and then finally the Roda, which is various sermons and uncategorized nar narrations that don't fit into any of the other categories in, in, in Al Kafi. <clears throat> 
Now let's talk about something pretty controversial. al Kafi's authenticity. So, uh, as everyone on Discord likes to say, oh, uh, al Kafi is 100% authentic. It's like, it's like Sahih Bukhari. No, no, no. Okay, look, look, no. Right. So I'm going to mention some words from Sheikh Rizwan al-Rastu. Uh, and I have his introduction linked on my website. Uh, I'll also, sh also share the link with that as well. So these are the main approaches that people have had with with respect to Al-Kafi's authenticity. So now, the majority approach is this. This is the approach of the vast majority of scholars. And that is that every narration in Al-Kafi is subject to a study of whether it is authentic and reliable. We cannot just simply blanketly accept any narration or any belief that is in Al-Kafi on its own. We cannot just do that, right? However, in my opinion, this kind of assimilates into the Majlisi position, but I'll explain that in a second. Now, of course, the discord radical Akhbari position, which is only held by Sheikh Amin Astrabadi and, and another scholar whose name I'm forgetting, um, the radical Akhbari narration, uh, approach is that, is that every single narration in Al-Kafi, every single narrator in Al-Kafi, every single thing is literally 100% definitely spoken by the Imams. There is no doubt in, uh, on anyone's mind at all that, that, uh, that every narration of Al-Kafi is 100% spoken by the Imams. Now this is the radical Akhbari approach. We don't need to, we don't need to address this. We don't need to think about it. If you want to, if you want to have a valid, if you want to read a valid criticism of that argument, Rizwan Arasu talks about it in his introduction. Um, and then finally you have the Majlisi approach, which I'll call, you know, the, the more layman friendly, the moderate layman friendly approach. So now what is Majlisi's approach? He says, look, we can't say for certain that every narration was definitely said by the Imams. However, however, we can be rest assured that when we look at the overall meanings and we look at all of the narrations in every chapter taken as a whole, we can probably rest assured that what we get out of that is a correct belief. And where there's conflict, where there's something confusing, Ilm al-Rajal can help us out and solve it. This is the position of Alam al-Majasi, uh, Rahimullah, who's one of the greatest scholars of our sect, and I think at least I think, and Rizwan, Sheikh Razwan Arastu, both of us think that this is probably the best kind of approach that a layman can take when, when trying to approach Shia Hadith. Now, going on, um, some, things, some things to consider when reading al Kafi. So, one of the things that I was mentioning was that if you look at all of the Hadith in the chapters as a whole, and you, you, try, you try to abstract a general meaning, you try to say like, okay, look, Here's like five narrations. They're all talking about the same kind of general thing. And I'll take this and I'll believe in this idea, right? So what you'll find in Al-Kafi is that a majority of the chapters, they'll have one or two strong narrations uh, in, every, in every chapter. Uh, and then a few weaker narrations, which will, which will corroborate the strong narrations and back up with a few smaller details. So if you go through all of the, if you go through all these chapters and you take the, the, the hadith as a whole, the meanings of them are going to be acceptable for you. The second tip here is that anchor yourself in strong reports. So uh, always be sure to look out for, for strong hadith. Always be sure to, to look out for and prefer stronger hadith over weaker hadith. Don't, don't you know, delve into weak hadith and, and start building castles of thin air onto them. You don't need to, don't do that. Right? As, I was, as I was mentioning earlier, prioritize authenticity. Prioritize strong reports. Prioritize uh, hadith which are corroborated with a lot of corroboration. And then the third tip, of course, is, is uh, don't develop tunnel vision on al Kafi, right? Uh, so, for example, what's an example of this? So, you know how I was mentioning that you should keep in mind strong reports, right? Well, some chapters you'll find, they'll be only filled with weak reports. So, for example, there's a chapter in al Kafi, Volume 1, where, uh, where it talks about the number of, uh, of letters of the great name of Allah that are given to the Imams. So, what's the great name of Allah? The great name of Allah is, uh, uh, you know, on the Quran, where Sulaiman was wants to bring the throne to, to the Queen of Sheba. Uh, so he relies on Asif bin Barkhiya, who says, you know, I have knowledge of the book, I'll bring you, I'll bring you this throne in an instant. So the great name of Allah is something that, that uh, Asif bin Barkhiya spoke. He, he spoke this, this great name of Allah, he made dua with it. And af, after he made dua, Allah had uh, performed the miracle and he was able to bring that throne. So what you'll find in Al-Kafi is that the chapter on that, on that narration all of the narrations there are weak. However, however, 
you if you if you follow this advice of only anchor yourself in strong reports, you might be misled. You might think, oh, this is a this is a chapter I might want to disregard. That's not true. If you actually look in Basar al Darajat, you'll find that not only is this narration that uh, that the of the great names of, of the great names of Allah is authentic, but it's actually mutawatir. Uh, it's it's completely mutawatir. It's it's almost undeniable. Uh, so don't develop tunnel vision on Al Kafi. Keep Al Kafi as your root. Keep it as your base, but. Be sure to look into other books to try and to understand and, and fit together different narrations. Um, and then the final tip I have you, if I have for you, is that uh, you should rely on Majlisi's gradings. Majlisi's gradings are very reliable. They're very good. Uh, if you want to, uh, they're they're actually not very far off from what you know Sistani would use or other traditionalists like him would use. Uh, Majlisi's gradings are very good, and you can use his gradings to actually check other hadith outside of Al Kafi. Um, and similarly, uh, with Mu'jam al-Hadith and Mu'tabara, what you can also do is you can also use those gradings as well and use them outside of books uh, other than Mu'jam al-Hadith and Mu'tabara. Now finally, our conclusion. So, what's to be said and said and done in all of this? The main takeaways from today. Number one, read Al-Kafi. Please, for the love of God, read Al-Kafi. And if you're afraid of reading Al-Kafi, read volume two of Al-Kafi. For the love of God, please, please read Al-Kafi. The second takeaway is the shameless plug. Please look at my website. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to, to big up myself. You can ignore my articles, I don't care. Go to the recommended reading section. Go to the recommended reading section and go through those, go through those, uh, 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 those links. They're very helpful for you. They have pretty much everything that you could possibly think of or need in the English language is going to be on the recommended reading section. And that's not an exaggeration either. Um, I, ha I have worked very hard to, to compile as many things that can be helpful for people and uh, I, I hope that my website is going to be helpful for people in this regard. Third takeaway, Bihar al-Anwar is not a serious reference. If a Sunni comes to you and says, and says I found this hadith in Bihar al-Anwar and disproves Shiism, you can just take it in one ear and out the other. You don't need to listen to them. The fourth takeaway is don't DIY your fiqh. Don't, don't go into Al-Kafi volume 5 and start trying to figure out, you know, like, like how can I how can I marry this Sunni chick? How can I do a muta with this Sunni chick? I, you know, no, don't do that. Please don't do that. Number number six, avoid polemics. Please avoid polemics unless you know what you're talking about. Read Shia hadith first. Read Shia books first, and then you can go on and prove Sunni. You can prove Shia beliefs from Sunni books. But in order to prove Shia Shia beliefs from Sunni books, you have to know Shia beliefs first. And then finally, finally, the last tip is to stay humble, stay honest. Remember, you're doing this for Allah. You're doing this for your religion. This is your religion you're taking into account. Uh, you, you are doing this because you don't want to be a bystander in your own religion. You are doing this because you want to know more about your religion. You want to know more about your faith. You want to have your doubts answered. All of the doubts that you could possibly have, you, you can possibly have are answered within our books. You don't need to look elsewhere. You don't need to look anywhere. You have to stay humble, stay honest, stay true to yourself. And you'll get, you, the whole world will open up to you as long as you stick with the words of Ahl al-Bayt and the Qur'an. Uh, and so with that all, with that all said, uh, if anyone would like me to cover any more books, just let me know. Uh, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, but I think we're running out of time now, so with that, with that out of the way, we'll, we'll open up for questions for any, if, that, if anyone has any. So we're doing a Q&A, right? Yeah, we're doing a Q&A. So if you want, you can... Okay, um, I, have, I have a question. My name is Hassan. And uh, I would first like to know uh, if ilm al the the, the, the bid'ah that you suggest, right, is correct <laughs> and real. <clears throat> where is it in the hadith? Have our imams talked about ilm al rajal the hadith and daif? Oh my God! <laughs> what, uh, what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this bid'ah you're pulling up the what air? What is this riba? What is this riba? This riba, this should... slander. You should read the you should read the Maqbula of Omar bin Handala. That, that you should <laughs> and don't and don't don't make the mistake that uh that thirteen Imams guy made with uh with trying to uh <laughs> um uh